angular momentum, conservation of energy, and scientific publications. We're going to be figuring out what exactly Euler's disk is and how it works. Before we get into the science behind Euler's disk, let's actually just show it. I'll show you what it is. This is just a disk. And it spins. That is Euler's disk. It's very cool. It retains its momentum almost perfectly. In fact, in a frictionless environment, and one that doesn't have any vibrations, it would spin forever. Welcome to our channel. This is Destructive Creativity. I'm Jonathan. This is my sister, Eliana. And we exist for you, for science, and for fun. If any of those things appeal to you, click subscribe and like. Any button you want, really, except for the dislike button. Don't do that one. You've probably seen this effect before when you spin a coin. Or a cup. They all work kind of the same. If I can do it. This is the conservation of momentum. Rather, the conservation of energy and angular momentum, which is very cool. Okay, first let's get into the history. Euler's disk was created and trademarked by Joseph Bendick around 1990. Now, obviously you can't trademark a law of physics, but what he trademarked was this specific shape. He machined this disc to the ideal proportions to make this effect last as long as physically possible. And it works really well. So why is it called Euler's disc if it was created by Joseph Bendick? Well, he named it after Leonhard Euler, who was a Swiss mathematician in the early 1700s. He did a lot of work with spinning objects and the laws of motion, so he just named it after that guy. In order to understand Euler's disk, and more importantly, why it stops, we have to understand something called rolling friction. That's right. So rolling friction is, well, very much what it, what it sounds like. When something is rolling across the ground, it's the force that eventually brings it to a stop. So if I were to take something flat and push it across a table, it stops because the energy that I imparted to this coin is used up in heat as it slides across the table and vibration or sound as it hits things. So rolling friction is a little bit different. If I take this, I don't need as much energy to move a larger mass of object farther, but eventually it will come to a stop. Hopefully. Oh, oh, there it goes, it stopped. <laughs> Good. So that stopped because although there's a very small surface point that it's touching the table on, it still is uh, distorting slightly, causing some friction 
perhaps the table is distorting microscopically, there's vibration, it's using up energy and sound, and all the rest of that energy that I gave to it is used up in heat that it's transferring to the table. The same sort of thing applies with the Euler's disc. The Euler's disc is machined so that one edge is slightly rounded. So as it spins around itself, it's actually rolling. It's not just spinning, it's rolling around a, a very small circumference. And as it lays flatter and flatter, the, the circumference gets bigger and bigger. But it's still rolling. And that's why it's the rolling friction that eventually brings us to a close. If there was no rolling friction or, vib or vibration, it would essentially roll forever. Okay, so let's explain why it moves like it does. So obviously, no matter how much we look at it, it's not gonna move unless something acts upon it to make it move. Otherwise, that would break Newton's laws and not very many things do that. So the first step, is to load potential energy into this disk. We load that by picking it up. We have now potential energy inside of this. If I drop it, it's going to fall down. So, we have now potential energy stored in that disk. If we push it over, it falls and it does not spoil. And spoiling just means spinning and rolling at the same time. So then we also need to, since we load, now we have potential energy in there, we need to impart kinetic energy in the form of spinning. So now it's losing its potential energy in the form of that gravitational energy by being be pulled straight down, but we've given it kinetic energy in, this, in a rotation movement. That allows it to spoil, so it's spinning around itself, it's constantly being pulled down, but there's, this is where it, uh, shh, shh. <laughs> this is where we get into something called procession, which is so cool. All right, so let me try to explain procession to you as simply as possible. As pertains to Euler's disk, when an object is rotating and a force acts upon it, such as gravity, that force can be seen 90 degrees ahead of the rotation. Okay, so let's pretend that this, di this circle here is Euler's disc. And if I were to blow on it using my breath as gravity, <sighs> it just goes straight down. Now, if we were to get it spinning, and then I blow on it, <sighs> you can see it start to tilt at a 90 degree angle ahead of the rotation. Now, because gravity is a constant force and not just a single breath of air, you're going to see the effects of gravity at the 90 degrees ahead of the rotation at all times, which gives you that spoiling effect. Like a gyroscope. <laughs> We've covered the history of Euler's disc. We've covered the, at least the basics of precession, so you can understand that. We've covered loading energy into it, potential and kinetic, and now we're going to bring it all together. We have a slow motion camera, we're going to slow it way down, and we're going to see how many of these things we can spot. Now I put some markers on top of this Euler's disc so that we can see how fast it's spinning, which is another cool effect. All right, here we go. Now, as this is going to start spinning behind me here, let's see how many of these different forces we can spot in Euler's disc. We've loaded potential energy into the disc by standing it on edge. We've given it kinetic energy by giving it a little bit of a spin there. Now, you can see the precession because as it's rotating around, gravity is pulling it downward, which means the effect of gravity is going to be seen at 90 degrees ahead of the rotation. And that's what gives it that spoiling effect, which is the spinning and rolling effect. Now, let's look for rolling friction. So, it's not just sliding around the mirror on the base there. It's actually rolling, very similar to what a wheel would do. But how can we see its effect? Well, I've, we've put a couple of those markers on the back of Euler's disc, and we can see it spinning quite quickly here. And this is slowed down in slow motion, so, We'll see if we can get some full speed. Yeah, there we go. 
Now at the beginning here, you can see that it's rolling around a circle that is much smaller than its circumference. And it's the difference between those two circumferences, the circumference of the disc that's actually physically rolling, and the circumference of the circle that it's spinning around that causes the Euler's disc to spin. And you can see it spinning fairly quickly at the beginning. Now as it winds down, it spins slower and slower because the circle that it's rolling around is slowly going to match the circumference of Euler's disc. And eventually, once those two circumferences are equal, it stops because the entire thing is touching the ground. Sometime in the future, I'm going to be releasing a full episode of just watching Euler's disc in awesome slow motion because it is beautiful. But for now, let's just watch it a little bit more and then we'll jump straight back to the conclusion. So cool. Who knew that a simple block of metal could have so many scientific principles contained within it? Awesome. It is so great to be able to play with and see science in action. Till next time, we are Destructive Creativity. Make sure you hit that subscribe button and the little bell icon beside it. All right, bye. If not for law enforcement and physics, I would be unstoppable. <laughs> <laughs>